All right. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the City of Farmers Branch Regular Study Session meeting. It is Tuesday, April 5th, 2022. The time is 3 p.m. We will begin with A1, discuss regular agenda items. Councilmember Driscoll. I'm good, thank you. Councilmember Merrick. Nothing to discuss. It's Member Lynn. Williams. I'm good. Tana. Nope. All right. Moving right along. A2, receive biannual update from the Historical Preservation and Restoration Board. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right out of the gates. <laughs> Moving quick today. More urgent? No. You're urgent. You're up. Let's go. I'm just getting training on how to operate the system. Okay. All right. My name is. Hello. We're here. Hello. Hello. Hi, Joseph. Uh, Johannes Hilkema here. And I'm here on behalf of the Historical Preservation and Restoration Board. Now, my wife told me before I came up here, and I, I, I admitted this to Hillary earlier today. She said, just because you have a microphone doesn't mean you have a license just to keep on talking. <laughs> well, she, uh, she's not here. <laughs> she's not here. But I want to just share with you, of course, you know, as an old teacher, we did these PowerPoints, and I could just give the kids the notes. <laughs> and we, they'd be just as knowledgeable as me read them. But I'm going to try to stay on script as much as it's possible. But it is important for me to communicate to you how important this historical park is to our community. You know, Carrollton has what Carrollton has, the square and they can get the gazebo and everything. But they don't have a historical park. They don't have anything that even looks like it. And, they don't have, and what we have in that park is a means not just to share history, but to build community. And that's what it's all about. So anytime the council, in their wisdom, decide to invest financially or any other way into that park, you are planting seeds which will bloom for generations. That's my off script remark. OK. But here we go to the script. And I gotta press these buttons here too. All right. All right. Uh, the mission to collect, preserve, interpret, and celebrate the history of the United States and Texas with an emphasis on Peter's Colony and Farmer's Branch. To provide visitors high quality programs, exhibits, and events through living history, experiences, and mission-based education with the goal of becoming a fully accredited museum that offers programming which will link our past to our future. And I'm going to go off script again because for the last, uh, last week, I was able to be a part of, uh, uh, what's the word, docent or guide? And I was able to go into that schoolhouse and take third graders and some fourth graders back to the year 1900. And that's, and you want to see their eyes light up when I put them on the dunce, on that little stool and put the dunce cap on them. <laughs> uh, there aren't enough pictures that mom and dad could take of that particular situation. But anyway, back on script. And since it didn't look like a full agenda, I just want to take, you know, Make sure we didn't come here for nothing. We appreciate your consideration. Okay. <laughs> Meetings are held the fourth Thursday of every month, and you're welcome to come. You know, they're posted. It's all very legal. You can come and enjoy the meeting. Uh, we welcome individuals to attend a meeting. Uh, we welcome, of course, the, the council <coughs> folks to attend the meeting. And some of you have, and we appreciate your presence there. We really do. Overall, the board members' participation is up 80% from previous years. And I think that's good. Uh, we just love what we do on that board. 
we enjoy it. And one of the reasons we enjoy working on that board is because we have someone who works tirelessly, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna just gonna have to give Hillary. <laughs> because she works, and I'm using the explicative here, damn hard to do what is required and more. So we created more opportunities for the historical park board presence of the programs and special events. Board members, uh, Danielle Betts, Missy Doors, Teresa Webster helped secure donations for, how many were able to go to the egg hunt? Wow. I'm gonna press the button. This is why Hillary's here. <laughs> All right. There we go. There's the, there it is. Thank you, Hillary. All right. That egg hunt, all, and in addition to the egg hunt, we had a Mad Hatter thing going on, right? That, and look, and we have uh, former chairman Ann Chrisman. Uh, we have Dan, the, the Mad Hatter, right? <clears throat> Isn't that right? Anyway, people have fun here. That's the point. People have fun here. And if you were at the, uh, if you were at the egg hunt, people had a lot of fun. I mean, they really had a good time. They enjoyed just talking. They en this is not on script. So they enjoyed just sitting around a pit, you know, chairs, talking with each other, having a, having a beer, <laughs> half a beer. The whole beer cost $7, but half a beer was included. Okay, all right. So, and it's not just current members that are active. Former board members volunteer their time to the historical park at the uh, sold-out Mad Hatter tea in March, former board members Ann Chrisman, Omar, where's Omar over there? He keeps, he keeps on, you know, getting involved. I've asked him not to come to some meetings, but he just insists. Okay, uh, and provided en entertainment with and charm as the Queen of Hearts and the Mad Hatter. The board did an excellent job of sourcing some really amazing prizes for the adult egg hunt. We had Brookhaven Country Club give a full golfing package, dinner for two, sweetest massages, local restaurants, Pete's Cafe, Four Corners, Blue Mesa, and Celebration donated gift cards. Early at North, uh, Italy, uh, Italy, that's Italy at North Park, uh, provided a uh, cooking class for two and Discover Farmers Branch gave a $125 gift certificate for the Renaissance Dallas North Hotel. We encourage everyone, because we're gonna do this again, to next year's egg hunt. And as you can see by some of the pictures, we had a great, we had a great, great time. Uh, just to go on about the egg hunt in a moment. Uh, the, goal, the goal here is to get people involved. Okay, I gotta press the button. That's why Hillary's here. <laughs> Because I just keep on running my mouth and she, okay. All right. To develop unique programs to bring more visitors to the park uh, and offer funding opportunities for families in need. By the way, on, on this, uh, that second bullet, the Friends, the friends of, uh, of the park, uh, I believe, do donated $500 in scholarships so kids could get involved that just didn't have the finances to do it. Uh, the staff arrives, the staff strives to make more people aware of the historical park by offering more unique programs to visitors who may not have visited the park otherwise. The newly launched DIY series has been an instant hit with sold out classes. Building a shelf from reclaimed wood and creating an herb garden. And as mentioned before, this is our first year for the adult egg hunt. We had 323 participants and over 5,100 prizes. Let me just break that down in terms of participants. 147 residents of Farmer's Branch showed up. And, but 176 came from outside of Farmer's Branch. <clears throat> I mean, that's an amazing thing. All right. Friends of the Historical Park again awarded $500 to sponsor four summer camp youth program scholarship for girls to make girls make history camp 
and hands-on history, Dirty Jobs Camp. It's important for the board and staff that we, that we are inclusive to all within our community. We're not, we're not all about making money here. We're just about including people and making, making the park accessible. I'm going to press the button, Hillary. There we go. Uh, Keenan Cemetery, which has been a big, a big project of the of the board <coughs> in the last year. The monument assessment completed by Texas Cemetery Restoration now have priority list for for which headstones need repairs, and what the estimated cost will be. The program to bring awareness of preservation efforts. In order for repairs to be done on damaged headstones, and it's an expensive operation, and it can't, you just can't glue them together. You know, it, it takes specialized equipment, specialized skills, and specialized materials. To bring awareness to the preservation efforts at the cemetery, the Keenan Cemetery Subcommittee uh, is bringing back the popular encounters from the past. A living history tour where you, where you have the opportunity to meet individuals buried at this historic graveyard. The event takes place April 29th from seven to nine, only $5. Several of our board, mem of our board and subcommittee members will be portraying famous Farmers Branch residents. And the presidents of the, the, res the Friends of the Farmers Branch Historical Park will have a representative on site accepting donations if anyone would like to contribute to the preservation work. Here's some of the up to upcoming activities. Encounters from the past, Mums and Sons. Charcuterie, right? Is that right? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't, I'm not sure what that is. Uh, Hands-on history. The girls make history camp and the Archella Summer Camp Carnival. Okay. I, I get excited about this thing. I mean, it's a great place. And if you haven't, if you don't, if you're not there regularly, you can just walk in, see a building or two, uh, and enjoy yourself. Have a picnic, take the kids to lunch, uh, a romantic evening with your with your other half. There's plenty of secluded spots over there, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> this is PG rated now, you'll want to so but this, anyway, that's why we, we do the egg hunt in the day. Anyway, thank you for, for listening. Uh, and any questions? I didn't think so. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Helkema, thank you for your, your leadership. But more importantly, thank you for your enthusiasm. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Your Honor. A3, receive a presentation from city staff regarding both the power switch program and the potential residential solar switch program by iChooser. Alex. All right. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council. So today I'll be doing a brief background information on the power switch program and providing some information on a potential solar switch program. We also have Kelly Balch from iChooser here today, if anyone has any questions um, for her. So we have contracted with iChooser since May 2018 to facilitate the power switch program. Uh, for this program, iChooser conducts reverse auctions, so interested residents will sign up. Um, iChooser conducts this reverse auction to provide residents with a lower priced 100% renewable electricity contract. Um, the 100% renewable is kind of a recent addition. That's why this program is switched from under Ben to the sustainability department. Uh, so we've been working with Far uh, iChooser on that for a number of years. We've had over 10,000 residents that have signed up to receive an offer. Uh, a little under 1,800 have uh, accepted their offer. Um, we've, and iChooser estimates the collective savings at around $737,000 um, for all of those residents that have accepted an offer. So iChooser is or, or also organizes solar group buying programs in other countries. They've had a large number of homes that have participated, and they're planning to bring this group <coughs> buying program to North Texas. So City of Corinth has already signed an MOU to participate, and so that's what we're gonna talk about further today if we wanna participate. 
So a solar group buying program, or what they call the solar switch, it's very similar to the power switch program. However, instead of receiving an offer for an electricity contract, you're actually receiving an offer for solar panel installation on your home. And so this aims to help simplify the process for both purchasing and installing solar. So if you think today, I want to put solar on my home, you're going to you know, look up reviews of companies, you're going to have to get people out there to do quotes. Um, so this is aiming to simplify that, you know, all these companies are going to be vetted, um, and then iChooser is going to handle the reverse auction portion. It also provides a financing option for residents. So the initial cost of a solar array is kind of expensive. A lot of people don't have that cash up front. Uh, this provides a financing option to hopefully remove that barrier where that you could pay off the installation over time. Uh, so that would all be an offer that you would receive as a resident. Similar to the power switch, you know, that group purchase can help homeowners save money it's buying in bulk essentially. For this program, there's no cost to the city to participate, and it aligns with our sustainability plan goal to increase renewable energy. So if we were to move forward with the solar switch program, it would kind of work like this. So next month, interested residents would sign up. Um, after you know a month or so of promoting that, having residents sign up, iChooser would host that auction uh, with installers to make sure to get the lowest price. The suppliers would have to meet vetting requirements, eligibility requirements, so we're ensuring quality. Um, and then it would be, you would receive your personalized offer with cost breakdown. Um, residents, you can accept the offer. They could move forward with the whole process, or if they choose not to accept it, if it's not the right time, the pricing doesn't seem right to them, uh, there's no penalty to not, you know, to say no thank you. If we were to move forward with the program, responsibilities, once again, very similar to the current power switch program. The city would endorse and promote the program. We would review marketing materials and the project plan uh, from iChooser. iChooser would be the ones to provide the registration website, customer service. They would organize that auction and assess and manage the selected installer. Here's uh, some financial information, just kind of a sample provided by iChooser here. So the left column is kind of your cost of business as usual. You just continue to make a normal electricity payment as you would. Uh, they're estimating this is kind of a, a solar array that will produce enough electricity for to match your usage. Um, you can see there is a discount. They're estimating about 22% for the group discount through the bulk purchase. Um, you know, with that payback period of about nine years, if you're able to pay for the system up front, that's that center column. Uh, if you're able to finance the loan, they're estimating savings from that uh, compared to your typical electricity bill uh, in this model. And so you would pay, you know, financing the loan for the, the solar array versus paying an electric bill essentially. Um, and they're still predicting cost savings with that. Within the offer too, iChooser is going to provide um, pricing option for storage as well. So if a resident is interested in you know, putting solar and battery storage on their property, there will be pricing information for that. So that is kind of a brief overview of the program. Um, with that, I'll take any questions. Kelly is from iChooser is here as well. So any questions from mayor or council? Councilmember Tana, any questions? Um, no, I don't have any at this time. Councilmember Williams? Now, a couple points. Um, the, the panels and the installation does come with a 25-year warranty. So, um, the, and the panels are expected, expected, I think the life expectancy is upwards of 30 years. And then um, since we put together the presentation, um, the City of Faith has actually come on board as well. So, you will be number two. Thank you. Yes, sir. So, I want to ask about uh, the panels and, and how how do you determine uh, exactly the need for a particular resident residents I should say so you would so I don't know if it was fully clear uh, an actual installer would come out to the home and determine what makes sense for your personal roof situation um, there is a hundred and fifty dollar deposit um, you would pay to secure that that appointment but if an installer comes out and says your roof is not viable, or if you change your mind, that's a fully refundable $150 deposit. So we don't make, they make that determination. We're not that skilled, but we work with installers that do. Okay, but if you had, let's say you had other companies come out and assess your property, and they said, well, we put up 15 panels here, mm -hmm. generate approximately this, we could just 
base off that. That's increase. exactly yes. Okay. And we and during the registration process, much like um, Power Switch, there are qualifying questions, um, and we've created some <coughs> algorithms. So just based on the, the where your roof faces, the pitch, um, is it heavily treed, the size of your home, the 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 size of your roof. I wouldn't know that answer, but um, it, it'll give you an estimate. So you'll have a general idea of what the potential cost savings that Alex showed you would be. Okay. And if somebody does go ahead and move forward with the program and they decide to finance this and then end up defaulting, what's the next step there? Is the city have any responsibility? No, or? no not at all. That would just be between the installer or the, the whoever's financing that loan and the individual. And um, we did have one gentleman have a question at one of the city council meetings, um, I can't remember if it was Corinth or Faith, about resale value. And there have been studies recently that show that there's a 14% increase in, in the home value if, if someone has solar. So, uh, so and this, this is a, would be a purchase program, not a lease. It's not a, it would not be a lease. It, you, would, you would have to either finance um, get a home equity loan, which is another <coughs> finance through the installer's preferred lender. Um, you can get your own lender, or you can pay outright. Thank you. Customer Merrick. This might be for both of you. Do we have a target of how many participants we'd like to achieve in the first iteration? And I know we've done multiple iterations of the power switch. So I know those numbers are baked on a larger sequence, if you will. So I don't know if we have a target. If we don't, that's perfectly fine as well. I'd be interested. I don't think we have a target right now. I know that um, the team that has run these programs in other markets um, has some, they're making some guesstimations. Sure. But it also it matters about uh, the progress we make with a few other cities. Um, the founder of our company is coming in next week to meet with a few other cities that have expressed some interest. Yeah. And so, again, the bigger the pool of people Certainly. that we can reach, the bigger potential. Uh, For savings, savings, but that wouldn't necessarily preclude progression into, obviously your team is going to come up with, uh, you know, an offer for the Merritt household. And if I accept that, and I'm perhaps the only person that accepts, we're going to work forward with that single. They're gonna, we're going to project. Um, so just like we do with the power switch, we're going to say this is the number of people we expect to register. Okay. So the, the installers are coming to the table with that number in mind. And so if two days before um, 500 people say, I'm going to cancel my registration, that's still the number that they're bidding. Understood. So. Okay. Very good. Thank you. You're welcome. You. No other questions. Councilmember Driscoll. Yes. Um, thank you for the presentation. And I have a question. You mentioned that the companies, the installers, will be vetted. What about the financing companies? Will they all be kind of in-house with the installers, or do people go to outside banks, credit unions, et cetera? The ones that um, the, the preferred lenders through the installers, they will be vetted. Um, <laughs> I don't know exactly what that process is, but I know that that's come up. And so I, I know that that's been an internal discussion. But if you decide to go with your own lender, or if Get a, you know, refinance, um, then that would be up to you, and we would have no say in that whatsoever. Okay, and you mentioned uh, that Corinth is going forward with the MOU and also FAITH. Right. And is this being rolled out statewide? Are you kind of test marketing it in this area, or? DFW. So um, Alex had a really good question the other day. What is what is that? And I, I think it might have come from you. Um, <laughs> What does that mean? What is DFW? And so we just went and decided, we pulled it off. Like here are the zip codes that are in the, the DFW area. And so anybody can participate. And the provider, the installers that we're working with can actually cover the entire state, but we're just trying to keep it reasonable, you know, kind of controlled and keep it in the DFW for the, for the first program. Unlike power switch, we will only do one a year. That's the goal. So well, that was my next question. One time. One time. And uh, since this is, you're just rolling it out or kind of testing it in DFW, are there going to be uh, first mover discounts if we move forward with this? <laughs> um, that's up to the installer. Mm -hmm. um, 
You'll get so much goodwill. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> and also a question, is the genesis of this, uh, where is that coming from? Is that coming from the bottom up or from the president of your company or from installers or, or what's the genesis of this? So there has been an appetite for a while with several of our cities and the cities <clears throat> that we have approached. Um, we're trying to work with some, some other uh, sustainability uh, nonprofits to kind of get, get things moving with some other larger cities. But this is actually based on surveys from residential households. I mean, it comes up all the time. Are you going to offer residential solar panels? Um, and it's also come, we've heard it from city leaders that want to achieve sustainability goals, and they see this as a way to do that. So, and we have been successful in other markets. And there are solarized programs and solar co-ops that follow a similar model mm -hmm. that have been implemented around the country, so right. this follows a very similar path to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. I think it's a very interesting program, and uh, thank you very much. I have one more question. Go ahead. Thanks. Uh, so when you provide information back, or, or maybe Alex, is something you do, um, obviously people that invest in solar, there's federal tax credit mm -hmm. that's available. But how do we know, or do we know, are there other credits that are available from the state or other uh, resources that would help to offset some of this initial investment? We will look into that to see. I'm, I'm in Austin, and so sometimes we have some little incentives that maybe other cities don't have. So that is something we would look into. And, and the installers are going to be pretty well versed in this. I mean, because this is part of their top track um, anyway. But I believe the tax credit in 2022, the federal tax credit is 26%. So, um, so any other things that are available to help lighten the burden? We're going to be looking into that too. Okay. Does anyone else have any questions at this time? I guess it would be fair to say that we would look for Alex to work with iChooser on a potential MOU to bring back to council to evaluate. Perfect. Cool. Thank you. Sounds good. Very exciting. Thank you. Next is A4, receive a report outlining on-street parking regulations for oversized vehicles and a proposed amendment to Chapter 82, amending the definition for prohibited and residential areas to limit the operation and parking of oversized vehicles in certain areas. Hey, good afternoon, Mayor of Council, Jay Siegel, Deputy Chief of the Police Department. And I am here again with oversized vehicle parking prohibition. This is going to be an update. So on the 22nd, we talked about issues with the current ordinance, discussed some of the remedies that were possible, and then I solicited council direction. And what it boils down to as far as the issues is that we, has a, we have an outdated ordinance that doesn't cover the newer residential areas. And so our proposed solution is to amend Chapter 82, Article 3 of the City Code of Ordinances with the purpose of protecting the health, safety, and general welfare of the residents of the city, to preserve the functionality and integrity of the public roadways, and to avoid any unreasonable restrictions on businesses and commercial traffic. And one of the key parts of accomplishing this is to amend the definitions to make them make sense to what we're trying to accomplish. And the two definitions, prohibited area and residential area, are the main ones. So currently we have a pro prohibited area definition that doesn't include the new residential areas and the same thing with the residential area definition. When we spoke last time, we talked about a truck route, and I showed you a map that had 53 streets laid out, and we were saying this is where the trucks can drive. So instead of that, the decision was made, let's stick with the current ordinance format and use the prohibited area aspect. But what we'll do is we'll include the newer areas. And what, what happens is you have a de facto truck route whenever that happens. This is what the new prohibited area is going to look like. And it incorporates the suggestions from the council. Incorporates, not incorporates. So you have there in the center of the map, let me see if I've got the, uh, 
bigger map. The center of the map is what the current ordinance has with a couple of modifications. So if you'll remember, we've got between Denton and Midway and then the North City limits and the South City limits. The difference was, was Denton Drive was accepted all the way through the city. Um, the, the mayor made the comment that he would not like to see Denton included south of Valley View, nor Valley View at all. So that is currently in the prohibited area definition. And then the city's far west side. So you can see all the shaded areas are prohibited area where a commercial vehicle is not allowed to drive. And we'll go over the exact wording of that prohibition in a minute. But so you see the truck route would obviously be the main highways that go through the city. You've got Luna Road and you have Valley View until you get to east of the Simmons Service Road. And then you have on our far east side, you still have Midway Road, you have Spring Valley connecting to the tollway, and then that, that whole area there on the east side that's largely commercial. And so along with those definitions, we wanted to update the definitions for what we're calling a commercial vehicle, trailer, semi-trailer, pole trailer. And to do that, we went to the Texas Transportation Code, and those are the definitions that are going to be used in the current ordinance. So the commercial vehicle, this is out of the Transportation Code, it's going to be basically what requires a commercial driver's license to drive. That's what a commercial vehicle is going to be. And in the most basic sense, it's a vehicle that's got a gross vehicle weight or a gross vehicle weight rating of over 26,001 pound. And here's an idea of what vehicles like that look like. And this is a chart from the Federal Highway Administration, and they use classifications for vehicles, and they put poundage to it, as you can see there. Kind of give you a mind's eye picture of what we're talking about here when it comes to commercial vehicle. So we're starting at 26,001 pound and going over there, and you can see you got your semi-trailers and your mixers and all the fire trucks. We don't want them driving around the city. <laughs> Here's uh, the rest of that chart. And then we get to the actual amends, amendments themselves, keeping in mind the definitions. So our 82202A, and remember, so 82 is vehicles, and then section, I mean, Article 3 is oversized vehicles. So 82202, the proposal will be no parking, stopping, standing, or driving any commercial vehicle, truck, tractor, trailer, semi-trailer, pole trailer, or any combination thereof upon any public street, alley, parkway, boulevard, or roadway within the prohibited area. So remember the map that's the prohibited area. B is something that's being added. So we're not just expanding the definition of prohibited area to say, okay, now you can't drive these commercial vehicles, et cetera, in a prohibited area. But also, B, no parking, stopping, or standing in commercial vehicle, truck, tractor, trailer, semi-trailer, pole trailer, or any combination thereof on any public street within the city's corporate limits during the hours of 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. So the intent here is to regulate the dumping of commercial vehicles and trailers in the commercial areas. And then 82221, this is specific to the residential areas, and we update the definition of a residential area to cover all the new residential areas. And it's unlawful for any person to park a commercial vehicle, a vehicle that has a gross weight or gross vehicle weight rating over 10,000 pounds, or any trailer in a residential area except by permit. So, this is analogous to the current ordinance, which says three-quarter ton. So what we're doing is we're just actually putting the poundage on there. And this, this is, well, I'll show you a chart here in a minute. But it's also something that we can, whenever we run a vehicle, the registration comes back, we get these numbers back on the return. So it's something we can say, yes, this vehicle is over this weight. So here's, here's some examples right here of what's going to look like. And remember, we're talking about this area right here, which is 10,000 pounds and above. So we're starting right here. Um, and just some examples to kind of give you a, some ballpark. Like a, a regular Ford F-150, 
you're going to have a gross vehicle weight there of about 4,800 pounds and their gross vehicle weight rating is 5,800 pounds because I don't want people to worry about, okay, I can't park my regular car, you know, on the public street. Um, a Tahoe, you got your gross vehicle weighting at 5,200 pounds roughly and then your gross vehicle weight rating at 6,800 pounds and then a Chevy 2,500 heavy duty. So we're getting into the one ton range. It's about 6,000 pounds and their gross vehicle weight rating is 9,300 pounds. Some exceptions to the ordinance. And this is going to be exceptions to 82202A, right? So the vehicles traveling to or from servicing a business, lots, or residents within the prohibited area, and vehicles legally domiciled within the prohibited area. And what we're trying to do there, and that's in the current ordinance right now, is if you have a business that's already been permitted by the city, it's already been approved by the city, they know what the business is, they know what they drive, and it's within the prohibited area, then it's okay for them to drive their commercial vehicles to and from. Passenger buses, wreckers, and then recreation vehicles, because they're subject to the permit requires under 82222. Let me go back to this vehicles illegally domiciled within a prohibited area. I'm always really good at doing this switch. And so there's a double exception in the current ordinance that we're keeping. So you have that exception right there that says legally domiciled within the prohibited area. I can't find the, but the other exception is except for this area. So the exception to the exception, except when there's no exception, <laughs> is Garden Brook, Towerwood, Enterprise, Trend, and Venture. So what that exception is saying is, okay, you have a legally domiciled business, you can drive in there, except for this area, because the ordinance doesn't want people that have a commercial business in this area driving through the city to their, to their business. And the thought process behind there is because it's accessible from Beltline and Webb Chapel here, and you can take a truck route to get to it without cutting through the city. Okay. So our exception is to 82221, and we'll remember that's the residential area prohibition. So we got pickup trucks or passenger vans used for personal, non-commercial purposes without commercial advertising with a gross vehicle weight or gross vehicle weight rating of 12,000 pounds. Now that's current ordinance, except for it's explained differently now in the ordinance. So this is just putting an actual poundage to one ton vehicle, 12,000 pounds. And then we have the vehicles parked on or directly adjacent to a construction site, which are necessarily part of the construction. And then 82222, which is the permit ordinance, is going to refer to your recreation vehicle and buses. And just, just for a reminder, for, so permitting for an RV, we call them at the PD RV permits, you can get one for up to seven days. And then a re, any one location can only have it for three times in a calendar year. And then also within that, that section, that 82222, we can give a permit for 24 hour loading and unloading in addition to those RV permits. So you get a moving truck in and they say, well, we're gonna take a whole day to get this house moved, then they can get a permit for the 24 hours. And that is the proposal, and I am here for some questions. Councilmember Tom. Thank you so much for the updates. Um, as you know, I just want to thank you all because we, I know we've been in communication with some of the issues that have been happening on the west side, which kind of prompted this conversation. Um, and just want to thank you all for your due diligence. Now I feel like we have something um, that you all could use as a tool, that we can use as a tool. Um, and so I'm very much um, looking forward to, to having this and extending this with making very clear black and white, you know, distinctions on what we're talking about. Um, one of the things that um, I'll have a few questions. Um, is there a way to add an appendix to this that has the examples of the tonnage, the pictures that you showed um, that has the different types? Um, only because I, I feel like I want to make sure that it's very black and white. And so, if there's a way to add an appendix that shows the pic that shows the pictures that shows every single little thing, because when I look at the ordinance, um, like bought, like the the moving trucks, for example. 
is not something mentioned. And so instead of, and, and I'll defer to you whether we mentioned every single one or if we just mention a few to give you an idea and then add an appendix that has the examples. Um, just because again, especially at, as it's being, um, it's new to the West Side, making sure that there is no gray area and people understand exactly what type of vehicles that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, if there's a way to do that, I think it would help. Um, and, and I don't know the best way to do that from an ordinance perspective. I would defer to our our our, um, our legal team maybe, but um, if there's an appendix of sorts that can show that where you can click on it and show this is what we're talking about. Yeah, and that's, that's a great question, and I would also defer to our legal team. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. My <laughs> yeah, we, I mean, we could either have something on, on the PD website. Make yeah. Because uh, it's more educational it than is, it is it anything is, else. Which is my next question. Well, yeah. I think we'll come back with some, some kind of suggestion. Perfect. Um, the My next question is regarding education, right? We want to make sure that folks understand what the change is, again, especially since some of these areas are new. Um, what type of education efforts uh, have you thought of related to this? Um, I know, for example, the, 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 there's a lot of moving trucks. Um, I know not just in my district, but in an, uh, the entire city, just because we have, you know, multifamilies and, and we have people that are moving. And so there is that 24-hour permit um, required for moving. Um, my first question is, a, could that be extended? Because sometimes people have a lot of, a lot of things. Can it be extended? Um, and if so, um, for how long can it be extended, right? If somebody's not able to get a U-Haul, um, a for example, until the evening, and then they wanna you know, keep moving the next day, um, but then it's a weekend, so then they can't you know, turn it in until a Monday. You know, what, what's, what's, um, what are your thoughts on that? And then um, as far as the, um, the education piece, um, what have y'all thought about related to that? So let me start with the education piece, because okay. you mentioned that last time, and so there were some thoughts put into that. Maybe not good thought, but there was some <laughs> thought put into that. So first of all, we were going to get your, your approval, the council approval, that yes, you're going down the right direction, mm -hmm. because it's going to obviously come to you in resolution ordinance format to, to be approved in a regular meeting. Um, so once that's done, that'll kick off the education part. And we would do it um, you know, on our website, but part of the ordinance is also that signage is required for this. So the city is going to have to go throughout and put signs up that tell people, hey, this is a requirements now on these particular roads. So that's part of the education. And then something that we could do also, specifically in you know, areas where we get a lot of complaints, is do a warning rollout. So we, we have violations, but instead of going right to citation, we give warnings and maybe even have some kind of flyers saying, hey, look, this is a new ordinance and this is what it, this is what it entails, you know, please comply. Because at the end of the day, that's what we try for anyway is compliance. Yeah. A lot of people don't believe that, but it really is. And it's, and it it um, definitely fosters goodwill too, so. Definitely. And then the second part about the 24 hour uh, moving period extending for the 24-hour permit, I wouldn't have any problem with that. And it's just, it becomes, what do you all believe is reasonable? Sure. Okay. And again, from my perspective, it always, okay, what do we get complaints on? And I'll tell you, it's not 24 hours, it's 24 minutes. <laughs> There's a car parked in front of, across the street. Sure. Get it out of here. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, so 24 hours is just what's in there now. We know that's from 1984. If if we think that people need more time, I'm not adverse to doing that at all. Okay. So, uh, so I guess I would put the question back on you all as a group and say, sure. what, what do you all think would be a reasonable amount of time? Sure. Or, you know, and I, I think definitely open to the discussion amongst my colleagues um, and just figuring out if it's, you know, maybe the first permit's 24 hours, you can get a one-time ex extension if something happens, so that way you're, you know, trying to do your due diligence. So, so I'm definitely open to that conversation. As far as the education goes, um, one other, um, I think, opportunity that we may have is to work with all of our apartment complexes to let them know, by the way, there's a new ordinance. Any new person that's moving in, um, let them know, by the way, if you're using you know, a, a truck and you're wanting to, to, to extend it or you know, overnight, whatever, make sure you get a permit because you'll need that to be able to park. Um, just because a lot of the complexes you can't fit a box truck into the parking garage so they do park along the street. Absolutely. Um, that just be, would be one suggestion. Um, 
The uh, another um, suggestion, uh, another maybe again refer to a legal team, an appendix item because one of the things that I get a lot of questions on is what are the construction times. So when you have the item related to the exception, adding an appendix that shows you know the exception is you know unless there are vehicles that are under construction and then show you know you can be able to click on it to show. By the way, these are the construction times. If you are one of those vehicles that are having to have the exception to be able to be on the property for construction purposes. Um, yeah. Again, just trying to find opportunities right. for us to share as much information as possible um, based on some of the inquiries that I receive, especially with all the construction happening in, in, in my particular district. Um, just a suggestion, and again, I'll defer to, to what, what, how best to, um, to share that information um, as part of this particular ordinance. Um, and then the, I guess the last question would be, um, you know, related to the, the exception um, on the, you know, 10,000 pound um, vehicle. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have a, a, a heavy duty pickup truck with a trailer attached that is full, I mean, that kind of teeters on, is that, is that allowed, is that not allowed? It I is. know we've talked about it. Uh -huh. Um, and I know that uh, in some areas, especially with so much congestion of vehicles, it can be a safety issue. So I'm just curious, what are your thoughts on that and, and how do you handle those situations? So now the way we handle it is the way the ordinance written it. If it's, if it's not in a residential area as defined, if it's a trailer over 18 feet, it's not allowed. This amendment says no trailer. Right, so okay. it is. It's going to kind of match what the residential prohibition is, which says that you can't park a you can't park a trailer on a public roadway. You know, you can have it in your driveway, or you can have it on an approved surface. That's fine, but you can't have it in the public roadway again, because what we're trying to achieve here is public safety, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and we have that all the time. Look, our views are obstructive, and, and they are. So we go forward this way, it's no trailers. Now, of course, your exceptions are if you're loading or unloading, sure. or if it's part of this moving process that you brought up and we, we permit it for 24 hours, so you can get it loaded and unloaded too. Gotcha, okay. thank you, sir. Um, I think that's all I have for now, thank you. Okay, that's Mayor Williams. Um, d just for a little clarif clarification, on the on the box trucks, mm -hmm. um, we that typically, that's gonna put them over that way absolutely limit. okay and right now that's prohibited if you're in a residential area the signs going into the main one you'll sh they even show a box truck right 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 there, so, okay yeah. perfect um and then um what i would encourage us to do uh i i love this ordinance i think this is fantastic for me on a on a professional level it it addresses some issues that we're having our, at our business um but at the same time I'm, i want to be considerate of our commercial um, neighbors and um, so I, I would uh, I would encourage us to, to provide some kind of notification especially to those businesses um, on the Gardenbrook and Tanglewood area because because this is going to be a very different um, ordinance for them with the with the 10 to 6 um, I, I, I think that you know I, I want us to be um, cognizant of, of not uh, hindering their businesses um, you know, for me, it solves a problem, but you know, for for a neighbor business, that may create a whole slew of problems that that we didn't think about or we didn't see all the way through. Um, and so, uh, you know, I don't I don't know if we if we need to. I'd, I'd like to see us provide notification before a resolution is brought uh, for us to pass, um, so that we at least give them the opportunity to um, to comment on it uh, in a public forum. Um, just because it solves my problem, I don't. I don't want to increase a burden onto you know successful businesses in our in our city. Um, but it, I, I think it's I think it's a great solution to some kind of ongoing problems for, uh, for me as, on a business level, and I know from for Councilmember Merritt's uh, district, uh, we both kind of struggle with that with that area. Um, so that's I would I would encourage us to do that. Um, with the trailer prohibition, um, that because I know we've got trailers on our parks and rec trucks, so that that that'll, that'll yeah that'll be accepted. I kind okay. of I kind of blew through those exceptions because it's gonna what's gonna be accepted is emergency vehicle, including fire department, right. 
and uh, you know public <laughs> maintenance utilities <laughs> and stuff like that. So, okay, good, right. good. And because, even you know garbage trucks and everything like yes. that. People providing services Perfect. to the residents and businesses of Farmers yeah. Branch. That because is, I know I know our parks and rec are next right. door to, our, to us a lot because I, I live right next door to the park, right. um, and I'm always real happy to see. And I will tell you this morning, right. I was super happy to see that trailer. Um, next to my house, so, uh, so yeah. I'm people glad. who utilize lawn services, yes. they typically have a trailer yeah. and yeah. They have all stuff, and they're providing the service there in the residence. So that's fine. So, so it'll be right. fine. Okay, yeah. perfect. Um, that's all I have. Thank you. Okay, thank you for bringing up the uh, 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. because I kind of blew through that real quick, and I, I was <laughs> looking for some response from the council if that sounded feasible to you all. Mm -hmm. And you know, like I said, whenever I brought it up, the intent is you know all this vehicle dumping that we see, and I hope that. A lot of the businesses will be amenable to it because anecdotally we get a lot of calls of, hey, yeah, I own a business here and people are just parking there in front of my business. And then we're right. like, well, sorry, it's a public street and there's really nothing to address it right now. So that does happen. You know, people from maybe Carrollton, I'm not trying to point anybody out, <laughs> will drop stuff off and then they'll come pick it up later and stuff yeah. like that. But not only that, we're trying to protect the residents on the east side too because we have that commercial area there. And um, so, you know, you've got Galleria, a little part of Simonton and Inwood and Landmark Boulevard that has the apartment complex there. So you see they're not in a prohibited area because we don't want to inhibit the egress and ingress over here. But we want to make sure that residential area definition is applicable to the apartment areas. And then also we don't have all those trucks and trailers and stuff getting parked between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. over there. Kind of keeps it moving. That's, yeah. that's the intent anyway. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so since you were just talking about the east side, uh, we'll talk along Simonton and whatnot, where you have apartments at one end of the street, mm -hmm. and then you have other businesses that do have large trucks and whatnot yes. that were parked on the street, and many of them were parked in front of uh, fire hydrants. Correct. Okay, so we've tried to remedy that by allowing uh, Fresh Point, I think it is, to store on site so that it gets them off the street, number one. Okay. okay. Uh, as I was listening, I, I was thinking, okay, we're going to need to have a pretty robust education program or process uh, for this with signage throughout the city, uh, some type of proactive communication campaign to businesses to let them know. I think that's uh, extremely important. All the while that you're talking, and especially when you're talking about 10P to 6A, I kept thinking, all right, you've got that neighbor who is moving his kid, and they go get the U-Haul, or it could be a rider or whatever, mm -hmm. the big truck, and uh, they go up to 26 feet in length box trucks, mm -hmm. um, and uh, they're getting their all the stuff loaded up, on Friday, mm -hmm. but they're not leaving till Saturday morning. Okay. Right. So, I I'm against just wholesale ticketing people that are doing that because you know they have good, they're not using it for bad intentions. Mm -hmm. They're they're trying to get something moved, and uh, so some type of warning program I think is is incumbent along with this, because most people, most res residential uh, citizens are not going to know. And that's going to be hard to get them uh, to become aware of this. I think we'll have better luck with our business residents than anybody else. And what I foresee there, and that's, that's a good point, it was, it was similarly touched on, is um, so in that particular scenario what we're hoping for is they avail themselves to the 24-hour permit right and what we do now is we get a lot of calls with hey there's an rv parked out here so an officer will go out there and they'll contact a person and say hey listen this is what the ordinance states you have to have a permit for this and the person will be like oh well, i had no idea and we're like okay and then they'll fill out the permit and they'll put it on the windshield so i would foresee something similar for that we go out there and we contact the person and say, listen, the ordinance prohibits this. However, there is a 24-hour permitting, and if they're legitimately doing exactly what you described, it's reasonable that they would get that permit. I, I think it would be reasonable, but I don't want to give them a ticket and then say, go get the permit. Right. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, 
then I also had a thought because we had a neighbor uh, in my neighborhood who had a $600,000 cigarette boat <coughs> that he would bring through the neighborhood every once in a while and park and it would take up the whole entire front of his house. Boat cost more than some of the homes. And it'd be there for a night. I think the longest it was ever there was like two nights or something like that. But it did happen on occasion. Mm -hmm. So uh, you're saying nothing over 18 feet in terms of trailer length. I'm saying no trailers, period. Right now, it's nothing over 18 feet. Okay. Excepting boat trailers. So in the, in the current ordinance, whenever you're talking about trailers in Chapter 82, you know, Chapter 56 is a little bit different, but Chapter 82, when we're talking oversized vehicle, that's why the length is there, 18 feet. So the proposed amendment here is going to say no trailers, period. There's going to be no length on them because it'll make it simpler, in my opinion, to match with 56, right? Okay. And right now, the definition of a trailer does accept boat trailers, um, but, and I need to check on this, but I believe 56 will prohibit a boat trailer unless it's in the person's driveway or improved parking service. Well, surface. Okay, there again, I'm sure there's some people that may be getting ready to go to the lake, you know, tomorrow, but mm -hmm. today they're loading up and they got their boat parked, you know, a hitch to a vehicle sure. in front of their house. They probably they might not be able to pull it in. They don't have a circular drive or they can't back it in or whatever. And so that could present an issue. So how do we address that? Well, I think again we fall to reasonableness because our officers across the board, we're gonna look for compliance. And I think <laughs> if somebody presents that scenario that hey, yeah, I'm leaving, then okay. That, that's fine, right? It's almost like you're loading and unloading. You're getting your stuff ready and you're leaving. But it, it's difficult to, you know, legislate every scenario. But I totally understand where you're coming from. I just, I, I'm just hoping I, uh, that there will be some reasonable understanding and sure. uh, common sense applied to this. Sure. As, as and we still have the back and forth with the city attorneys <clears throat> coming up. You know, I mean, this this is what we're proposing. They're going to look at it and say, okay, we need to consider this, that, and the other thing, too, prior to you all seeing the final draft here in a couple weeks. And, okay. and we can come back and find two, two of this ordinance later on if there's unintended consequences or if there's something we've missed. So. Okay. That's fine. Thank you. just don't want to wait, okay. you know, 40 years. Some of the ordinances we're talking about are pretty old. Understood. Thank you. It's all my time. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> That's, so good. That's a good one. <laughs> Score one for Jay. That's a good one. Um, I think I'm just going to kind of uh, compound the use cases in the education part. I think it's super important. We can all sit here and say, what about this? What about this? I think it's really important if we could uh, capture those use cases and have that appendix that was referred to a couple of times before and the, embedded into the education to the aspect and the outreach to both our businesses and the awareness of the residential uh, community. I think that's super important, um, as well as the, the warning period. I'm sure you and the other administrations in the PD will make sure what the appropriate awareness, and we communicate that um, as well. But I think it's, it's well intended and it is reasonable and there's some common sense behind it, but I think it's super important that we add the pictures. I think that's, you know, that we're going off Texas commercial, I think Texas transportation code. Yes, sir. Uh, it's not that we're conjuring this up in a vacuum. We're using some stated uh, universal industry terminology and we're approaching it to where our businesses can still do business. Our services and our first responders can do, still do their services in first responding. So we can get past some of that as you read it, just in that fine print, you can't do this. Well, your mind simply wanders um, just through normal course of contemplating this. But if we have the use cases, we get used to this and over time, Pete, as you said, you know, if there's some unintended consequences, we can address those. But I think we're heading in the right direction. And in education, to me, and communication, you've heard it for 
the entire time I sat in this chair, super important, but to have those use cases to where we can expand on a trailer, a boat, the kid coming home from college, you know, et cetera, et cetera, in the residential versus the business, I think it's super important. Yes, sir, and point well taken. And to that point, because we have now, you know, people seek affirmation instead of information, mm -hmm. and they'll read just a little chunk of the ordinance, right. and they call us up and say, well, this can't be there. And you're like, okay, well, now you got to reference the definition. Right. Now you got to look at the exceptions. Correct. So, mm -hmm. point well taken. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sir. Councilor Andrew. <coughs> yes. Um, thanks very much for the presentation, Chief, and the clarification. You missed um, a great one last time. <laughs> well, I watched it online later. Okay. I was at a conference. Well, I'm so, glad. Yeah. I wouldn't miss it for anything. <laughs> um, Except that conference. Uh, just uh, kind of echoing some of the other comments and discussion here. Uh, I think this is, you know, an improvement on what I heard you did last time, and uh, I think it's rational, and as Pete just said, I mean, if we need to tweak it down the road, we can do that, but I think the overriding thing is it has to be rational and workable, and also not to put your officers in crazy situations, and so I know, you know, you're always looking for compliance and things like that, so I think the educational part of this will be very important, and the signage and having the descriptions and you know, a lot of people are visual learners, so they can say, oh, no, that does include this type of vehicle. That's better than a thousand words. And uh, I know with a lot of situations, you know, your officers have some discretion. I would expect they would have that also, because no matter how we craft this, there's always going to be exceptions and problems. I mean, we can have a weather event. Someone could be in the middle of moving. Uh, our business is moving some heavy equipment. We get a huge storm like last night, you know. Well, and, uh, you know, people get sick, there are accidents, all kinds of things. So I can see many situations where someone's not going to get the job done, whatever it is, in 24 hours. And I would hope, you know, the officers have some time to, as you said, give warnings rather than, you know, tickets. And, uh, you know, have that officer discretion because there are always going to be, you know, situations that, that come up. Absolutely. Yeah. That's all I have. I have one more question. Um, so as far as the timeline goes, um, we, we had the study session last time. We had an update this time. Um, do we foresee um, you, all, you having the conversation with legal to bring that back at the next meeting so that way we can, okay, yes. great, perfect, thank yes. you. All I wanted is the thumbs up, especially yep. on that 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. Yep. Yep. Um, the other stuff, like I said, you can match it back to the current ordinance just sure. in an updated fashion. And then can we, is there a way, um, it will have a, as soon as we pass it, then that's when it would move forward. Mm -hmm. And so is there a way we can get um, maybe a six month update or something like that to see how it's going? Any kinks, any issues in case we need to come back and make any changes? I think that would help with any new, <coughs> with any new changes to an ordinance like this, especially with the education piece. Um, just to see if there's anything else that we can do to enhance it, if there has to be more direction or more clarification made on the ordinance itself. Absolutely. We can even flag calls. That way we can have some empirical data to share. Yeah. After six months. Perfect. Sure. Thank you. Councilman Lynn. Nothing. Councilman Mayor. Quickly, I know we said 10 to 6. Do we know if do we have any businesses that work in these odd window hours that I would say odd to me because I'm a 9 to 5? Right, eight to five person, but a lot of delivery companies work at different times. You mentioned Fresh Point. I'm not sure what their working hours are, but there's some concept of that. So, and and I don't know the answer to that question, but we did consider that in the aspect that okay, if they're doing business and they're coming to and from, they're accepted coming in the prohibited area, or anything, okay. but they still can't park on the public street between those hours. Correct. Right. So that's something they're going to need to allow for. Right. Yeah. And that, that seems to be a common prohibition in other cities during those hours. Yeah. Fair enough. Also, Council, I want to mention that when you get the ordinance, we'll have a red line, and you'll see a lot of red lines because we're getting rid of a lot of sections that are outdated, no longer applicable. We're moving definitions all into one section, so it should be easier to follow, more user friendly. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Charles? And uh, just a quick point of clarification. The, uh, we, we can certainly have the ordinance back to the next meeting, but I also heard that you didn't want to see it until we had a chance to notify the commercials folks. Like and that. we're not going to have enough time. I think that's important. I think it's important. To we, we won't have enough time to, to get uh, the word out, especially if we're looking at if one option is sending a letter to all the commercial folks in the, in the areas and wait for them to respond uh, or, and or have a meeting. Right. So I just want to let you know that that's we need to have some kind of a which which way do you want that? 
Could we do, and I think we've done this before, where we bring an item um, for public hearing, but we don't take action, and then the, to, to get, have that opportunity, and then the following meeting, that's when we take action. We've done that before. I think, I don't know if it was with something regarding sustainability, or can we do that? So that way it's more of a public type thing, and then we can notify them and have the two weeks, a couple of weeks to do that, and then come back. Like have a, it, we could have a public hearing on the Comment 19th period. to just go over it and people can come speak to it if they'd like and then potentially take action the first meeting of May. And that would just give them two weeks. That would only give staff two weeks to get those letters drafted and out to our um we, we need we need businesses. to have comfort that you're happy with what we've proposed before we start oh, saying yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. Okay. Council Member Lynn. In the meantime, so, those are escaping on. through through the loopholes in the current regulations will continue to escape. So it's, it's, it's important, I think, that you have a comment period. And if this is what it's gonna be, whatever the final draft looks like, we should probably send that out to the businesses in town and uh, give them an opportunity, give them with 30, 45 days to comment and then the council can <coughs> take Technically, that. they'd have two periods to comment. Yeah. I'm sorry? Yeah. They'd be able to comment on the 19th and on the 2nd. Well, will they have the information by that date? We'll at least have the draft ordinance. Yeah, so you'd have a draft. Right, so perhaps have a, draft. a summary, of, uh, perhaps a summary of what the major changes are. You can't do this, you can do this. Yeah. Here's some examples. It gets where it gets complicated is, is saying here's a hundred page ordinance look at look check it out I think to me the message is here's a map your business can no longer use the pink areas to tr completely traverse the city and then all areas you can't park overnight from 10 to 6 yeah. what do you think yeah. I think yeah. I think it's actually pretty it's, it, I think it's, so. mm -hmm. yeah I think it's just those two points that we you got and really to, with with our with our businesses it's the 10 to 6 and and then that and then that west side addition that's the only part that's gonna that's a big change that they need to be aware of and I mean can we get that out quickly enough to have and, a public hearing by the 19th and because you know, you don't know the unintended consequences on commercial folks that might be in the middle of the pink. Right. right. Uh, and so I, th I would think you'd want to send it to pretty much all of your commercial businesses right. just to say, here's the thought. Yeah. Uh, if it's if it's all the commercial and just these two things, we could probably do that fairly quickly. Um, Did you get it out by Friday? Um, I mean, we're not hand licking and, and standing. Right? No, we're not. No, we're because not. Because he's right. Because he, they would have the two opportunities. Because that would give them the nineteenth if they were really on it and watching for it. And but then they'd also have the night of the actual ordinance, Correct. which, which would be two week weeks. Of May. So, so that gives us four weeks. I think that's, most I think that's good. Most businesses are busy if we can. running their businesses and not always following what we're doing every two weeks. Correct. So I'd be more in favor of you know at least a thirty day notice or something like that. That gives them 30 days. It does. That gives them two weeks and mm. two weeks. That gives them well, four weeks. Not quite. Not quite. And I'd like 30 to 45. Go back to your calendar and look at it. I don't well, think if we do, Well, if we do that, it would be, we're doing it now. If we get it out by, for example, Friday, again, they'll have two weeks where they receive the information. And even if they don't make it to the 19th, then they'll have another two weeks to give us feedback regard, you know, by the by the May 3rd meeting. So well, that is businesses more Businesses are busy running their businesses. What is the rush all of a sudden? I mean, what's wrong with 30 to 45 days? The rush is that, I will tell you from, from my perspective, in my area, this has been going on for a year. Okay. I understand. And so, so it's been going on for a year. So can't we give 30 days of a notice because we're making a huge change for people running the businesses? That's my point. I support what you just said. So then we would do it on the second meeting of May. The second meeting, which would be the 17th. Okay. But while Charles is still here, we're not doing things while Charles is while <laughs> Charles is still here. Still here. Just just keep in mind that you're going to be changing. There, there's going to be potentially at least one seat of change in council. So you're going to be asking a new council person to vote on something that that may be controversial that night. Um, hey, right into the fire. Yeah. Eyes wide open. <laughs> I mean, we do do it with budget every time. <laughs> That's well, no, but budget's after May. No, but, it is. I'm just, I'm just, okay. teasing. Right. I'm just teasing. <laughs>
I think, I think the courtesy here is to our businesses, and I think that's we need to have that courtesy. To do. Uh, I know it's important to the residents; it's important to all of us. But let's let's have an equal balance to our our businesses. No, I agree. I, I just don't want us to wait another uh -huh. six months for us to do something. Um, doing a comp like a, a big comprehensive period. I think um, I think that gives us ample time. But you're right. There's only two real the big the two big things is really adding that west side and then the, the 10 to 6. So I, I'm okay with that. Okay. That's Sounds it. good. All right. Thank you. Thank you. A5, discuss future agenda items. Councilmember Driscoll? Uh, nothing right now, thank you. Councilmember Merritt? Um, I'm going to piggyback on to what uh, Councilwoman Ratana brought up about the availability of funds. Many of us today, I assume, receive notification from uh, Congresswoman Von Doon regarding their appropriations. So I'm very interested in that uh, overall process. Um, not to say that I want to take act personal action, but I want to know how this body and this organization works through that appropriations process. So I'm just going to kind of piggyback onto that. Uh, future item, and I think she has a date of April 21st. Yeah, it's coming up in the morning really quickly. Mm -hmm. That's all I have. Van Dyne. April 21st. I'm sorry, Van Dyne. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Councilmember Lynn. Uh, so I'd like to have some discussion and analysis of the SUP process to see if it can be streamlined. Okay. Is that all? Yeah. Ms. Williams? I was going to recommend the same, um, that we need to review the SUP process and, and when an SUP needs to, you know, are we in line with the other cities in that process? Are we being business friendly? Um, are we hindering um, a change of, of uh, business because of uh, how restrictive our SUP process is? So I'm new to the whole SUP process, to be honest with you and Charles, and I had a discussion on Friday. I had no idea that it was that involved. Mm -hmm. some, so. people, some people like to have their thumb on everything. So I know I, know I should have called Allison. Um, so I'd, I'd like to I'd like to have an overview of that whole process, and then us review if we're in if we're in line with other cities um, with that. So. So I will third that um, <laughs> just because very, most recently there's been some some questions regarding that and, and some just gray area. And so I'd love to have that conversation. So um, the second thing I have, I have two more um, PNZ updates. I know um, a while back we had um, some suggestions to um, changes to the PNZ process, um, updating um, where folks go, because there have been many times where I've gone to the website and it doesn't doesn't work. Um, and then also adding um, the verbiage around um, being able to email it and whatnot. So just a quick update on where we are on that. Um, and then also to have a, a, a more extended discussion regarding um, an easier way for folks to know exactly um, what's going on um, in, in some of these zoning cases or zoning changes that were being proposed. And then the third thing is, um, and I wanted to bring it up during the, um, the discussion we just had um, with our police department, but um, in talking to our you know, expert city manager, may have not have been germane to that particular point. So wanting to bring it up um, in looking at um, the, some of the areas in the west side, you know, a lot of this, the, the, the way that it was developed, we don't really know kind of some of the repercussions on how it was developed until people are actually living in there. And so um, there is, has been a long extended discussion along, um, with parking along Charcoal Crest um, in preparation for a new signature park and making sure that there is less congestion in that area um, along that road. Um, I want to have a discussion regarding not allowing any parking along that street, especially as it has a lot of inlets where folks are trying to get out of their, um, of their not, not their driveways, but their overnight parking. Overnight parking, sorry, yes. Uh, no overnight parking along Trot Road Crest, especially as, um, as folks are trying to um, get out of the, the alleyways. Um, it's just become a, um, a, a quality of life issue, and so I um, would like to discuss that in a late, at a, a later date. Okay. Thank you. All right. With that, I'll read in executive session. 
Council may convene into a closed executive session pursuant to Section 551.087 of the Texas Government Code to discuss economic development incentives for Project Select, to discuss economic development incentives for Project Root Beer. Council may convene into a closed executive session pursuant to Section 551.072 of the Texas Government Code to deliberate regarding and discuss the purchase, exchange, lease, or sale of real property north of Valley View, south of Valwood, east of B, west of Josie. Council may convene into a closed executive session pursuant to Section 551.074 of the Texas Government Code to deliberate the appointment, employment, and selection process of El Jefe de Ciudad. We will recess. The time is 4.15 p.m. We'll come back into executive session in five minutes. It's De La Ciudad. De La, yeah, that's right.